Hi. Hi. Um, hold on. I always ha I, I never remember how to turn on my camera. Turn on video. It's on the, there it is. Yeah, I found it. I, I can found see it. you. I can see I you too. Too. This thing off. Um, but um, I think I have figured out some sort of temporary solution. Um, if I log into, and we don't have anybody here yet. So if yeah. I log into my website and upload the pages as a media file, I can send a link to the media file that way. Mm -hmm. And so, but I'm thinking maybe we shouldn't talk about this here because it records all of this for the replay and not everybody needs to know about all of our back end. And stuff. I will edit edit that out. So yes, oh, you're you right. can edit um, that out. Okay. Um, I can, but but um, I think I have figured out some hang sort on. of and we are on solution. We are um, live I, on um we are live on YouTube at the at Beltline to Broadway handle. So it is in fact, simulcasting. So people could chat or whatever. I wonder with if we us. could simulcast to multiple YouTube channels. <laughs> I'm thinking in future for future things. I don't know. I don't know. And when we are oh, off no. camera, I can. We, we, we can, can kind we of can go over here. this because I have a feeling um, we may just need to upload it. Either set up a separate thing for and yeah. download things. I think I think that might be a good idea. But um, we certainly can do that as well. And let mm -hmm. me see if I can log on to my. It's saying I have poor quality, but we have you know the YouTube thing. I have tried, I have tested and my per my personal Facebook. So that's where it is. Mm. Anyway. So got it. Um I'm guessing we'll have people jumping on. And I figure we maybe should not start for three more minutes, but since we're here. Like I'm sure. still trying to figure out the whole uh um what's it called? The whole fireside thing. thing. The whole mm -hmm. fireside app. And yes. then I'm also thinking, so let me, because I was thinking that, oh, Jesus, um, I wanted to, why, why Facebook? <laughs> You're killing me. <laughs> um, I, I'm trying to access my Facebook and it's like, Hey, re-enter your password. I was like, why this That's morning where I was. And, and yeah. I've got all these, you probably do too, but I have all these layers of like, yep. Two, two FA layers and layers and layers. <laughs> mm -hmm. so. But I really like, you look so nice. I like the sweater. I like the whole look. You mean I don't look as frumpy as usual, is what you just tried to tell me? <laughs> no, you look ready to vote. You look like a badass. <laughs> I am a badass. That is why I look like one. I am going to find my password so that I wanted to find the little thing about um, about the show and put it on LinkedIn. That was really wh where I was going. So I'm going to do that while we wait for two more minutes. While we wait for folks. And if folks don't come, that's okay too. Because I didn't post it till late today because I been running around. <laughs> because that's life. <laughs> that is life. So but I'm excited. You know, it's been um I mean one of the things we can talk about tonight is it is two years since we started this. So I'm wondering oh my goodness what life lessons or what lessons we've learned from being in this community together mm -hmm. online during COVID and now post COVID. So we could talk about that. Yes, we should. We should definitely talk about that. I agree. Give me two shakes. I'm resetting things. Um, how 
fast. Can can we um can we have a quick chat off camera after our show so that I can tell you some good news and so and an idea I had um and an idea. <laughs> okay. Absol absolutely and yes, I have um other things right after but yes we can. <coughs> does, we can do this does not have to be long <laughs> that is fine anyway how has your week been um it has been in a week already so. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh no yeah, it has been a week hello lolo frost um hello, welcome Laura. to our uh to our new fabulous improved time. We are here. Do you want to give us an intro, Miss Lauren? I can. And hello, Laura. And um, I do have the simulcast working. So if you want to follow along and chat easily, you can do that at YouTube slash at Beltline to Broadway. I'm Lauren Van Hamert from Beltline to Broadway. And I am here with my friend, Andrea Kaler, who runs Coloring Broadway. She's the president, founder, color in, colorer in chief, creative behind Coloring Broadway. Um, and we started this um, show to kind of continue and record conversations we've we've had over the phone just in private about musical theater and things we've learned from musical theater. And then we go, gosh, we really should record this. And so this is that. And now we are fusing together the coloring um, aspect, the community coloring aspect of this. Um, Laura, I can put the link for the November coloring page, which is a Hamilton coloring page that you might already have, but um, it's the room or it happens page. If you would like to color along, I can throw that into the the YouTube chat. So would you like to introduce yourself, Andrea? <laughs> now that I've got quite a long introduction and I, I love it. I'll just take it all in. Um, really the long and short of it is is that Lauren and I love musicals and theater in general. We love to talk about them, about the fun parts, about the light parts, but we also like to get into really deep conversations. And that's really where my favorite part of it is. It's it's where um, musical theater or theater or story or media connect with the that place that resonates with us and finding and then digging into why it resonates and what about it resonates and, and the beautiful, wonderful opportunity for self-discovery because for me and for what I know and for what I believe in is that the only way that we advance as humans is to know more about ourselves so we can operate intentionally in this world rather than from our patterns and habits that are a lot of the time subconscious, right? So that we can be super conscious and intentional with how we operate in life versus unconscious. And theater is one of those things that makes us shift that, right? We go in, we might be unconscious, we might go in, we might take in something, and we know that it resonates with us, but why? What about it resonates? What What about it made us scrunch our eyes and or scrunch our forehead and go, hmm, I wonder about that. Like, those are the meaty, juicy, wonderful, I mean, if you're a vegan, the juicy, wonderful moments. I won't, I won't mention meat. Um, Anyway, I don't know why. I think I just had a conversation with a vegan the other day and I was like, let me be cognizant of not making meat references in my in my stories. So, you know, it's so interesting to me, Andrea. Um, some some people know that I am a theater critic, arts journalist. And in the past, I have always gone to the theater notebook in hand and I've taken notes during the show. The last couple of shows I've been to, I've actually forgotten my notebook. And so I have been completely present and I'm finding the experience so much more joyful, but I'm also finding that I'm much more in tune 
with what I'm looking at, which makes it easier mm -hmm. to review. So it's been very lovely. I think I'm going to abandon the notebook. <laughs> well, it is it's so interesting. Um, uh, for me with that is that, and I think it might be my neuro spicy brain, right? Like part of it is I have lots of what I like to describe as fireworks moments where like, I'll be watching a story, something happens and suddenly it connects to 17 different things. And I want to remember them all. And like the progression of how they related to the thing that inspired me off of that one little note or that one little lyric or whatever. And that's when I really want my notebook because I know I will not be able to get it back unless I go back and rewatch the whole show, which is one of those things where people, I find that some people don't understand why people go see shows over and over and over again. And I'm like, it's because each time you watch it, it reminds you of different things and it reminds you of those connections that you had in the beginning. And then also wherever you're at now, you have another layer of connection and relating. It's fascinating. It is. And I think to um, Jagged Little Pill, um, because my reaction to Jagged Little Pill was very um, impulsive and reactionary, and I will be seeing it again in February on tour. And I feel like I'm just in a much better headspace because I know what's going to happen. I know where the storyline is going and I will be able to experience it a little bit more um, fully without being so impulsive or reactionary to it. So I'm kind of excited to see it again. Interesting, because now I want to know what your reaction, I, it's been a couple of years now, so I don't remember what your reactions were then, but I definitely have my set of emotions that I still remember from it. So I would, I know we're not immediately jumping into 1776 and more musicals about his, history and things and elections well, this is and how stuff. we do it. We just go, well, we go. We gave ourselves, we gave ourselves a little guidance. I'm sure we'll get there. We're so. swervy. Um, for me, um, it took me, um, so I saw Jagged Little Pill alone. So I should start from that premise. I should never have seen this show alone, mm. but it was very triggering for me. I, when I was very young, was a victim of a sexual assault. And what I did not realize in this story was, and I, hope I'm not spoiling this for anybody. So um, Jagged Little Pill spoilers coming. If you don't want spoilers, then I know. you want to turn this off, fast forward. Um, but what I did not realize is that this is MJ's story. And MJ is the mom. Mm -hmm. And the the what she's going through is very similar to what I went through because I suppressed a lot of... I didn't mm -hmm. have an immediate... Um, response to what happened to me except to suppress all of my feelings and so I did not deal with any of those feelings for years That's and years right. and years and by the time I did it I was like whoa so to see that playing out on stage in this raw and beautiful and unfiltered way um as Alanis Morissette tends to do um kind of took me off guard because I did not expect that so that was my reactionary part of it. I'm excited to see it again, to see some of these other storylines, to see, um, because it's also a story of healing and catharsis. And that part of it was lost to me because by the time I realized what was happening, I was like, oh, every trigger in my brain is, this, I'm oh. going to a whole different place right now. So um, I'm excited to see how that healing journey goes because I, I think that's what speaks to, oh, as problematic as some of the aspects of Jagged Little Pill are, that's the part of it that I think speaks to people. So um I'll be interested in seeing it on tour. Well, I thank you for for sharing that because that is not an easy thing to share. That was a piece of you that not everybody gets to see all the time. And I do remember now 
you know, it's amazing how our conversations like are so deep, but flash forward two years and I'm like, wait, what did we talk about? So I apologize for forgetting um, why that hit you so hard. And I, I, I don't, I mean, there's all other things that we can go into about the fact that I don't remember most of my childhood, but I don't have any memories of anything that, that was as challenging for me in watching that show. But for me, the, the way in which her struggle to be the mom she was and, or she wanted to be, or that she thought she should be, um, just, just, there were so many layers of complexity and the way that they put the story together with, with her, with the mother's story and the husband's story and him trying to figure out what had gone on, what was going on with his wife. And then the other layer of the two kids and what happens with them intertwined in, it just like even thinking about it gives me that that chill moment where it's such a beautiful coming together of a story and these layers and telling the story in all of its heaviness, but also all of its beauty at the end where, and I don't say beauty from a light fluffy like rainbows and unicorns, but the beauty of the human mess where people don't just check out and peace out and be like, hey, this is too difficult. This isn't what I signed up for. I'm out of here, right? The, the part, and, and I'm also not saying that that's not a reasonable thing to do if you are in a position and you need to peace out. I totally get it. But watching a family come together and actively all work through the challenges at hand to become better together and yes, that does take all of the people working together and not just one being, you know, being something that that won't work. But like that was a beautiful homage to what humanity can do together. And that is like, but outside of that, like the representation, like that dance scene with the mother and her inner demons holy magnificent physical portrayal of emotions that you can never identify using words. And this is why art is so powerful on all of the levels because it took not just the lyrics to that song, not just the music, but also the embodiment of those emotions where words fail. I mean, and now I'm like, and now I'm quoting Ben Platt in uh, Dear Evan Hansen, but words absolutely fail in, please tell me what's going on, right? Like there's nothing you can do that, or nothing you can say that will adequately convey those, all of that like whirlwind tornado fire of, of, of emotions. And they just did such a beautiful job with that. Probably I thought the choreography in Jagged Little Pill, that that particular scene that you're talking about with the couch, um, and then just all of the choreography and how it um, played into really telling the story. Because I think to look at choreography as part of the storytelling is a very contemporary thing in musical theater. Um, so, you know, I think for a long time that was lost. You'd have these um, dance breaks and they really didn't make any sense except they were really fun to watch. Um, now I think that there's a sophistication to choreography on stage and that is a brilliant um, example of it in, in this show is how the... Hamilton too, how the choreography really works to tell that story and elevate the story mm -hmm. um, is amazing. And you mentioned Evan Hansen. I just saw Evan Hansen last yeah. week um, again. And um, I have been critical of Dear Evan Hansen, but I will say this particular tour cast and this particular Evan, whose name is Anthony and I will look it up when I'm not the one speaking. 
Um, I know. He, he, we he, just can't be. <laughs> he's brilliant in this. So if it is coming to a city near you, um, the last tour casting was a little bit problematic. And at least when it came here to Durham last time around, it mm -hmm. was highly criticized. Um, this tour cast seems to have gotten back to the roots of what made this story um, relatable. And somebody wrote me last night and said, you know, as, as crazy and despicable and self-centered as so many of these characters are, you have to like them for this to work. And in this particular production, they are likable. <laughs> Except for one, who is kind of the... Um, who is supposed to be not likable. <laughs> who's supposed to be not likable. But, but, but Evan, the kid, Anthony, and he's not a kid, he's 30 years old, but um, he did such a good job conveying the suffering that Evan is going through throughout the show. And it becomes very evident in this production, more so than other productions, that this image of Connor we're seeing that's talking to him is the image of Connor he's manifested in his head, not the image of Connor as he was. And that's another place where I think the, the show gets a little muddled. And here it was very clear that what th this isn't the actual Connor. This is. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's definitely, there's definitely that I have, I have thoughts, but I don't want to derail your, your thought. Yeah. So, so that's, that, that's all about Evan. And we, we can just, I feel like Evan Hansen might be a whole conversation for like a whole show of this. I think we should definitely, I, but I still want to share because you know, that's, Please do. <laughs> these, that's how these conversations go. Um, I, I, there's a place where I feel is, so let me start with the, the criticisms I've heard and that seem to be the most challenging and painful. And also FYI, I haven't done, I haven't read like every article criticizing it. I haven't, you know, like I haven't done like PhD level research to make sure that I can cite my sources. So let me, you know, start with that. But the critiques that I've heard of of it are that there's no consequences for Evan and that he he's very self-centered and that um and that and and that, that leaves people feeling um feeling wronged as if somehow Evan doesn't get punished and there are no con there are no like, there's no accountability right so there's it's kind of it's kind of interesting because it's a thread of like is it accountability is it is it punishment like what do you want do you want evan canceled do you want him to understand the the depth of the 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 pain and the badness that he's done like what is it you want do you want the accountability and the awareness or do you want the punishment either way i i mean i would like to argue that Evan is completely aware of the wrongness and what he did. And at the same time, he was un incapable, ooh, and I'm gonna cry, he was incapable of stopping himself because, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, he's played as somebody who is on an autism spectrum or has, has anxiety, he's going to the doctor, like, this kid is not a kid who has a healthy mental spectrum, right? He, he's, he's broken and he's trying his best to figure it out. And with the, the research and the depth and wealth of information around neurodivergent brains, there is no way that Evan doesn't know that what he's doing is commiserately wrong and all of the challenge around that and at the same time he can't stop himself which he also beats himself up for so there is running in that and of course you know i am 
totally projecting my life experience here too. So don't get, <laughs> don't think I'm not, but this is, this is how these things resonate. Like when I was watching, whew, when I was watching the show, all of a sudden, cause I'd listened to the music before I went and saw the show. Holy ugly crying that I did not expect because there were some scenes that connected things in a very different way than how I'd listened before. And I was like, Oh shit. Like everything I had gone through in high school, having a neuro spicy brain, having these experiences where all I wanted to do was fit in and I never fit in anywhere. Like, and, and, and stuff that like, I now know more about my brain and can see what was going on for myself. Like, I think that that this criticism that there wasn't enough punishment or accountability fails the mental health observation and knowledge of what he actually is going through. And you can have the argument about whether he had accountability and he had to atone for his sins of, you know, doing what he did. But for me, I chalked it up to he knows he is punishing himself more than anybody will ever punish him and and actually actively not punishing him was the kindest thing they could do because the adults got it and it's the adults that needed to do it so anyway those are my those are my deep and apparently very emotional painful thoughts about Dear Evan Hansen. Well, and the really interesting thing about Evan, um, I I think um, <clears throat> in the review I wrote of this production, I actually wrote a letter to Evan Hansen. I, I framed it as a letter. Mm -hmm. When we first saw this show, um, I had seen it in 2017, prior to the Tony Awards with the original Broadway cast. There was something so raw and beautiful about Ben Platt's performance. It was ridiculous. It, it moved me in a way that I, I was um, mm -hmm. shook. I think somewhere between the Tony Awards and the movie. The, oh, the, don't get me started about the movie. The, 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 the whole concept the whole story got lost. It got too big. It got yeah. too um, cocky. And, and I'm not just talking about Ben Plant because I don't fault him. I just fault everybody who has, has had a, a piece of this, who allowed this to happen. In this particular production, it very much reminded me of the first time I saw it. Um, prior to the Tony Awards, when it was just this little show that nobody had really ever heard of. Well, um, and, and, and what I realized about it was a couple of things. The, the main thing is that the story never ends. It, there's not an ending. It's not Evan paid his price. And so he went to college and everybody lived happily ever after. It is it's not, not tied up in a little bow. It's not. You are witnessing Evan in what you and I would call mid-work. He's the, doing the, the work. Middle. You can yep. see that from that last letter he, he narrates. Mm -hmm. But he's not finished. He's not, he hasn't done. No, he's, I think he's, that, I think work that in actually, progress. I think that <laughs> speaks to something that happens in today's society where we want to see the culmination and we want to see the finished product because, and, and that speaks to cancel culture, right? We want them to have some sort of comeuppance. We want them to have their, their, their cancellation. You can't do that. So you're done. Well, what's on the other side of that? Are they just done as a human and they're not allowed to do anything ever again because of this thing? And do not get me wrong, I am not advocating for not having people have <laughs> do their due diligence, get their their punishment, get their get, I am not advocating for that by any means at all whatsoever. But I do think that there's space to talk about what cancel culture versus what accountability. 
actually looks like because accountability looks like Evan doing his work. It looks like a kid who, again, can we just talk about your prefrontal cortex is not fully formed until you are 25. So you're talking about a kid who is 16 to 17 years old. He's already dealing with anxiety and some sort of, you know, like, I, I don't know if they've ever addressed what sort of autism or spectrum um, he's on or the depth of it. But like, he's obviously in that neuro spicy place. And so with that, you are not talking about a fully formed adult who has done all of his learning and growing and, sh and should have known better, right? You're, you're dealing with a kid who's trying to sort some stuff out. And can I also say pot, kettle, black, or cast, what, what? There's a Bible reference about casting your pearls before a swine. There's another one in there about like, uh, do what you say, not what you do, what I say, not what I do. Like, Everybody has done some really horrible things in their lives that if somebody made a musical about them, people would want to cancel them. So, you know, <laughs> I think there's room to yes and this in true theater sport fashion and say, yes, I understand what you're reacting to. And I think it's possible to not... Um, to. I think it's possible to have this be a beautiful show that that's worth it. And I, I think you are right that the grandiosity that, that happened with the movie and like the, the, the way Tony, the Grammy, the performances I mean, and all of it. Like I remember, so I did not get to see um, Ben Platt um, perform as Evan on Broadway. I got in there I actually think I was supposed to see him, but it was Taylor Trench's first put on. And so I got to see Taylor's very first put in, not put on, put in, put in. So like, here he was, it was the first time he did it in front of a live audience, full cast, everything. It was brilliant, right? Like, so I can't speak to Ben's performance, but the, as you said, the rawness of what was portrayed on the on the 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 stage that I saw was so humble, like and to hear people who are like, "Oh, that kid's just full of himself," and he's just and I was like, "That kid is so scared that he does not know what to do, and he is making dumb mistakes and can't figure out how to get out of them." The other thing that I I thought was just so powerful is outside of this, the mental health training that the entire cast and crew got as a result of the flood of mail, email, contact from audiences who were resonating with this so powerfully in a way that nobody else had resonated with them before require like the the cast and the and the creatives were receiving these letters from kids talking about their very painful stuff so which necessitated and i am so amazed and and thankful that that the that the creative and all of the the, the staff the crew the 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 industry that is dear evan hansen um gave everybody this training on how to respond how to show up how like what to, like the cast and creatives all had to have their own training on on this to support their audience in ways. And I just think that's so magical. It It is. I wish they would go one step further. So Laura, um, <clears throat> Laura is coloring her jagged little pill page. So I think we have inspired a whole different thing. <laughs> and um, she, she let me know. Anthony Norman is the kid's name who's playing it on tour. Um, mm -hmm. Again, he's 30 years old, so he's not actually a kid. Mm -hmm. um, he's been in Newsies and he's been in other shows, but he is brilliant in this. Um, the only thing I wish Evan Hansen had done, and if parents are watching this as a replay, and I know YouTube sometimes does these little... Um, if you're watching this on YouTube and you're, you've gone to the chapter marker that says Evan Hansen and we're talking about Evan Hansen, um, I did see some very small children in the tour mm. audience. 
the small child sitting in front of me was eight or nine. Kids are at all different levels, so I am not judging any parent for bringing a child to musical theater. I want you to bring your children to musical theater, but I also want to say with the caveat that this is a show that's going to necessitate um, some conversations. conversations. Um, and it's that's important. what good theater does. But I know in my review, I found links to the, um, there is an Evan Hansen book. And at the book, they have guidelines for educators and guidelines for parents, like book conversation. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, the only thing I wish with Evan Hansen is that they had some sort of um, student guide or educator guide right on the tour page. Yep. Um, they, they need to, they need to have conversation question or conversation starters somebody. and, and some, and some suggested conversations to have as a result. And then of the only other thing I thought they were missing is at any time you're dealing with mental health issues like this. And I did put it in my review and, and, actually reached out to Dr. Hurwitz, um, Dr. Drama, our friend, mm -hmm. to ask her if I could um, post something. But I think it's really important to share resources with people. I think when yeah. you're doing any kind of a show that's going to trigger intense emotions, which something like Evan Hansen, something like Jagged like Little, Jagged Pill, Little Pill, Pill, right? Yeah. You need to provide some resources, and and I didn't see any in the theater. So the the only two things that I would suggest, and I have some of the the tour contact information that they gave me as part of the media, are those two little things, which are simple things to do. They don't really cost a lot of money. They already have the the talk back questions on another site, but that's not where yeah. people are going to look for them. So. Yep. Yeah, no, people people aren't going to go there and then think about going to look for the talkback questions. They're going to open their playbill, and if they're not there, or if there's not a page in the playbill that at least says, hey, need to have a conversation about the content of this, here's where all of the stuff is located. Here's the QR code where you can go to it directly online. That would also work. But just having that direct connection to, to the follow-up. I think Jagged Little Pill needs that too. I I 100% do. Because and I'm not a big one for trigger warnings, but I think when you're dealing with a, a show like these, which are so emotionally intense, and I know there's probably many other shows that are emotionally no, intense. No, but you're, you're like, I think you're spot on with this one because the, um, the, the amount of trigger warnings that are needed for um, Jagged Little Pill because there is sexual assault, there is drug overdose, there is harrowing um, deconstruction of marriage. There is, you know, like there's, there's those are on so the like, severe. What? Yeah, there's so, there's, so there's definitely yeah. like LGBTQ, like, sexuality gender stuff that comes out with that so like there's so many layers that could touch so many different people in so many multiples of different ways it would it would and again i have it this is my point and i think this was yours too i'm gonna go see it again here in seattle on thursday next week thursday or friday next week this week because time what is time? I don't know what time is. Um, oh, Thursday, Friday, Friday <laughs> this week. Um, but unless it jumps out, like I'm not going to do a whole bunch of like researching it to find this stuff before I go. So it would be really awesome if it were in my playbill. And I, as I thumbed through, I was like, oh, hey, mental health resources or trigger warnings. By the way, this, this show has references to this, 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 and this in it. Because yeah, like it's I even like... Yeah. It, Go ahead. It well, and I think where this show in particular, Jagged Little Pill. <clears throat> I think if you listen to the music, Jagged Little Pill, you you mm -hmm. get a sense. You know, anybody listening to that cast album or familiar with Alanis Morissette's music, you, you're going to get a sense of not where it goes, but where it could go. Um, 
I think with Evan Hansen, because you've got all of these um, <clears throat> bops, for lack of a better word, that mm -hmm. sound so fun and and boppy and musical theatery, um, that it's not easy to decipher. It's it, it would be easy to say, oh, my eight year old listened to the soundtrack or a cast album and really enjoyed it. And yeah, I mean, I I know I in in reference, like I went with my friend and her eight or nine year old daughter to see Hamilton. And yes, there's the whole Maria Reynolds stuff, right? Like, hello, there is a very adult themed thing that happens right at the top of like act two, right? And so do we have conversations about it? As we need to, as we needed to in the car on the way home to ask her what she thought, like how she was dealing, not how she was dealing with it, but like just even to check comprehension, Right. Like, you know, I, <laughs> this takes me back to my lovely story that I always like to tell about Greece, because as a as a four or a fourth grader, I loved the movie Greece. I danced to it. In fact, we did it as like the, the end of the thing recital with the whole bunch of kids and choreography. And it was great. And we did we go together. Um, but my mom was always like, why can't you watch a different movie? And I was like, but I love it. And then at, when I watched it again at 19, I, my, my jaw dropped open and I was like, oh, that's why my mom didn't want me to watch it. There were so many sexual things in it that I didn't comprehend as an eight to 10 year old, right? So I think it's that point where it's like, you get to check in with your child and see what the conversation needs to be around it versus all of the telling. But yeah, and and I think um yeah, definitely. And I'll be so curious when you see this show and I I hope you see it with this kid Anthony. Um mm. he's yeah, such a talented actor that. and the way he and um the woman Colleen Sexton who's playing his mm. hello Demetrius welcome. We are talking about Evan Hansen but we're going to stop talking about Evan Hansen, talk about 1776 and, and the other things <laughs> in a second. Um, but, but it's, it's, I'll be so curious to see how you feel about this. So, um, but anyway, and Demetrius, if you want to, um, color along, um, part of, part of what we do here is we talk about musicals, um, and and uh, Lauren, this is a great like time out. Let's reconfigure ourselves. You, you and do the thing. Yeah, do the t say or, the thing. Do, say the thing. We're a we're a, a, a set of nerds because there's two of us. We are a set. Um, Lauren is a theater journalist. I work in leadership development. We both love theater. We both love the power that theater and story have to create self awareness, to create moments of resonance, and then to actually dig a little deeper and find out why the why the what the how of that and to see how theater and story can actually shift our lives for the better that's the you know happy rah-rah version of it but really we like to just dig into all of the musicals we have talk about talk about the things and uh go from there and we got off on a jagged little pill um moment because uh we, she's she just recently seen seen it saw it and I will be seeing it um this weekend and it's got a lot of stuff and it's really layered and heavy and beautiful and wonderful all at the same time so Lauren would you like to shift us to the intention we had which was to talk about 1776 and other musicals about you know like bold, politics and history so two years ago um I <clears throat> called Andrea, who I didn't know very well at the time. And I said, um, could we call her on election night? Because I don't want to watch TV. <laughs> I don't want to watch the results. <laughs> and I think we should we should actually say Lauren hosts Beltline to Broad Broadway, which is her theater journalism space. And I, in addition to doing leadership development in the corporate space, I have a company that creates coloring products that are inspired by Broadway musicals. So it's a company called Coloring Broadway, and hence why she said, hey, can we color? And we really did sit with the fact that um, we, uh, we had this really heavy election coming up. We 
didn't know how to like process feelings. And the best thing that we both could think of was, hey, why don't we get all of our theater friends or anybody who wants to join, give them something to color and sit and actually talk about it. We could talk about light and fluffy. We could talk a little bit heavier. We're not gonna go down politically specific paths, but we can talk about what's going on in our own reactions to what's going on in, in the world and in the election. And so we hosted our first coloring night and then we did them all throughout the pandemic. Once a month, we had <laughs> these great coloring nights where like 15 people would join us and we would all sit around. We'd pick a, um, a theme or a musical to start with. And as you can see from our conversations, they it kind of goes around and around with whatever sparks whatever. Um, but we would start with a musical, and everybody would print out their 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 um, coloring page, and they would color it. And then we, you know, halfway through, and then at the end, we'd have this beautiful Zoom screen of these wonderful, beautiful, creative things that everybody had put their their specific unique take on and for me that's always what's exciting about the process of coloring and having that digital downtime and that space to create is that creative avenue allows people access to their own uniqueness and it also the the neuroscience you know nerdy person of me um also loves the fact that that's an actual calm down for your brain that helps disengage you from active problem solving. We're in our lizard brain all the time. Um, and it quiets that down and creates room for you to actually have bigger thoughts. So by having that non-cognitive coloring task where you can just kind of do something that's a little bit repetitive, all of a sudden these conversations happened that were so big and so beautiful. And yes, thank you, Laura, who was like, she was like, yes, I was there as part of them. And so as Lauren and I have started this, and I know things now, um, fireside chat, we are like, let's bring back in the coloring element. Obviously, I'm not coloring right now. It's a little different. It's a different sort of feel than everybody being on a Zoom together and talking. So maybe we'll have to do a once a month actual Zoom with exactly. color because it would be really nice to see and chat with people um, easily. But that's really where that that all came from. And now we find ourselves two years later in the midst of elections and other things. And so we were like, well, why don't we talk about, you know, 1776 and other like historical musical thingies. So, so I did not see 1776. Tell me you did. Um, this new revival. So tell me your thoughts about this gender fluid, gender swapped production. It's, it's really interesting that, that that's not a big deal. And let me explain why it's not a big deal. It's, it's because <laughs> what's really obvious is it doesn't matter who's playing who, as long as the story is being conveyed. Right. Like there's moments where I'm watching this, I'm watching characters interact, I'm watching them do what they're supposed to do in 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 service of the story progressing. And I'm forgetting that it's being played by women versus men or g gender nonspecific performers versus male pr presenting performers like it didn't matter. It was. It, it got to that point. And then there was also the moments where I was watching it going, oh, it's really powerful to see it being played by women and having some of the lines in it that hit very differently because they're said by women. <laughs> and you're like, oh, uh oh, -huh, yeah. So it, that was it, an interesting thing for me to think about in reference to having seen it because there were times where, I stopped thinking about it as being a gender bent performance. It was just the performance. I love that though. Yeah. I love that it wasn't really about the gender bent stuff. Yeah, it like was it was it was a layer. There was a layer of that, but like there was also just the story. Love that. And and honestly, like for me it was the importance of the story being told behind like 
I'm thinking about it in reference. And also I'm really glad we're talking about this because it's been a couple months since I saw the show and you know, my neuro spicy brain. It's like, I'm here. And then I forget things. Um, so it's nice to have, <laughs> thank you for the forced reconnection of, of what my brain experienced. Um, but in thinking about, you know, where Hamilton tells this story, which is now somewhat well known, right? <laughs> because Hamilton has caused all of this, like, Hey, let's learn about Hamilton and the history around it. Um, 1776 tells a different angle to the story. It tells the side of the story that you don't get in the history books about the compromises that had to happen in order to get the document signed. And th and and the vehement objection to all of the compromises and they weren't even compromises. It was some bit like People had other people bent over and they couldn't get out of it otherwise. So they had to make the hor the horrible choice of if, if I stand on this hill and die on it, this thing won't actually happen. It, 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 and, it, and it just brings up like great fodder for conversations about what you do in those situations. And, and the other thing that I remember out of that is the the light that got shown on at least for me of generally humans all humans are not actively trying to be assholes they are doing the best they can with the circumstances that they have been presented in life which then result in their way of thinking and all of that and most people think that they're acting from a place of being a good human. And so for me, what it did is it, you know, yes, the founding fathers in white American um, uh, schooling have been held up in this like, you know, pantheon of like, oh, they're the founding fathers, they could do no wrong. Dude, they were just men who were in the place at the time, doing the best that they could trying to figure it out. And you had some who understood what was at stake and who understood that humans needed to be respected in all forms. And then you had others that fully were trying to do the best they could with their parameters. And they were, they were just figuring out, but they weren't these infallible superhumans that they get painted to be. And so it was the opportunity to... I won't say it's not, it doesn't, humbling is come, it's, it's a humbling, but it's, it's more just like realizing that they're just as fallible as the next person. Cause also, I mean, Barack Obama, dude, he didn't, everything wasn't perfect. Um, uh, uh, what's his, what's his name? Clinton, not everything perfect. Like people in pl places of power make dumb mistakes all the time. And they act with the best that they can moving forward. And hopefully they surround themselves with other people who help them be better, but they're all just trying to be the best humans that they can. And of course, this does not relieve them of the consequences of their actions, but it, it was a, it was something that I came away from 1776 with that, that humility of, they're just humans. They were just men trying to do a thing. And then the next people can come around and do the next best thing because they learned from the, the, what happened before. And apparently I'm just being Italian tonight. I love that though. You're, you're, you got the hand, you got I'm the. So passionate. Okay. Anyway, I'm a dork. <laughs> I'm a dork. Um, so what I loved on Halloween is we had this very short list of, musicals that we thought resonated with the Halloween spooky theme. Mm -hmm. And then as we were talking, we had like a hundred more <laughs> musicals that resonated. <laughs> well, um, so, so are we other talking than about 17, musicals? Seven, <laughs> other than 1776, other than Hamilton, which are the two, you know, obvious ones that come to mind. Um, another gorgeous show that I thought about that really, um, 
as I was thinking about this election cycle and some of the things, some of the issues, is ragtime. I oh. love ragtime, and I think it's so poignant. So, um, and and definitely musical about America, America ideals, American mm -hmm. dreams, immigrant immigrants, all of it. So, um, so ragtime, I'm going to add to the list. I think that's great. I have never had the fortune of being able to witness on stage ragtime. Someday I, I will. But honestly, this also makes me think about Paradise Square, which was really sad that it closed because it had a good story to tell. Whether it needed to be truncated with fewer people on stage, that is a conversation for another day. But it, it was a very sad um, closing and it did tell a very it told a tale of something that you wouldn't have otherwise learned about. Um, but in thinking about the ones that are the, the plays and the musicals that talk about politics, obviously in the background, I can see the one day more illustration, <laughs> which is bringing Les to mind. Um, but I had to do it, Andrea, because we were talking today and not tomorrow. I had to, I just had to. <laughs> one day more. <laughs> 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 um, but it also, it, you'll see me looking around us because I'm looking at all of the the uh, the theater posters on my wall. <laughs> um, so if we're talking about like historical or political theater, the band's visit mm. needs to go on that list because that is one of the most beautiful stories I've seen of showing the coming together of people outside of their ideologies in order to connect. Ooh, yes. And it was, it was, it was really, it was really phenomenal. I'm like, what else do I have? And I would venture to say, and I have so many mixed emotions about this because I've seen this show one too many times, but I would venture to say Annie is very um, or Americana like and political in its bent. And from what I'm hearing, I did not see the touring cast when they came here, but from the people that were that I trust, um, their opinions. <laughs> um, from what I hear, this new tour is really tapping into this. Um, oh, into the into the historical time period yes. elements. Yeah. Yes. So there was, um, there was a lot going on. I mean, obviously, there are a number of other musicals that touch on history right um and on and on historical things but before we go too much farther because i know we we have our hard stop at at seventeen thirty, which is because my phone is in military time that's what i think about so at five thirty, my time eight thirty, your time do we want to open it up for Laura or Demetrius to come up on stage and ask questions or at least like be part of the conversation? So it's not just two ladies yeah. talking about their musicals and Definitely. things. Definitely. Laura, Laura, you, <laughs> Laura's got like a whole list. We're making lists on YouTube. <laughs> um, but Laura, do you want to come up and hang out and um, we can invite you and let's see how, how do we do it? Invite. Um, invite to video, Demetrius. I hope we're going to invite to speak. Yeah, I think I think I clicked the right button. If you don't want to, don't. But like, I just it's that's where like the Zoom was so much fun with the coloring is everybody could speak and and chit chat and 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 <laughs> such. Hello, Miss Laura. Hi. Uh, let's see. Hello. Hey. Yeah. We hear you. Again. We, we can hear you, we can't uh, see you. There are two buttons at the bottom of your screen and I think if you hit one of the, one two, of the buttons, two buttons, buttons, it'll, it'll allow you to turn on your video. Yeah, yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, right now I'm just trying to find it because of, I don't see it on my phone right now, but I see my voice. Yeah, we can so hear you. Let's just yeah. have your okay. voice on you. Okay, cool beans. But you might have to mute but us you on YouTube. To, you may have to turn off the um, YouTube, though. Yeah, so, yeah I so did that. We're not hearing it in stereo. Awesome. Yep, I did that. Okay. So, 
Yeah. I just, I, I, I heard us kind of veering off into the, like, let's start talk, talking about musicals that, that bring up historical time periods. And I was like, we can't not talk about the color purple. We can't talk, uh -huh. not talk about Porgy and Bess. We can't, like, there are so many that show different elements of, as you were saying, Lauren Americana, but like we, you know, there were just so many different things. I was like, hey, let's talk about all of them and bring up Laura and Demetrius. You're welcome to at any point come up. And so. and POTUS. I mean, not not POTUS. in the musical. Oh, God, yes. Not in yeah. the musical realm, but we can't ignore POTUS because I'm hoping to see it someday in either a revival or a local production. <laughs> or yeah. just a really long Saturday Night Live episode because that's really all. And that's <laughs> I definitely saw that. <laughs> you know, I, I I hate that I'm I'm just I feel like I'm speaking a ton, but I happened to go to POTUS on the night that Hillary Rodham Clinton went to POTUS. So that was an experience <laughs> in and of itself where in the middle of the show they said something about like the power of female, blah blah blah, or a female should be president. The whole show stopped. The spotlight went on Hillary Rodden Clinton and everybody applauded. Like it was, it was a really cool moment. Moment. I love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that in the theater. Um, and, and Laura, another show that I love um, is Bandstand and you, you yeah. added yeah. Bandstand and Newsies and Dogfight to the list. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. circling back around to basketball never seen dog fight that's another one i'd like to see yeah laura. go go ahead laura okay uh i know i have seen newsies that's fun um i've only seen bandstand in the movies i know it came to ohio but it was like really really far away in ohio from where i live so i didn't get a chance to see it but um uh, definitely I love the AMC theaters were available and then, and then, um, Dogfight was just another one that I thought of because I, I, I haven't listened to the soundtrack. I know what it's about. I know mm -hmm. it's about American history. Um, that's really about it though. I have not listened or seen Dogfight. Um, another show though that I'm... Miss Saigon also deals very much in this Ameri this idea of the American dream. So I'm going to add that to the also, yeah. also West Side Story, which I really, really enjoy. Yeah, I loved this. The, I'm just saying things out loud because, you know, that's what I'm going to do here. But uh, I really loved the, the movie version of it, the new movie version. Me too. Because have you seen it? You've seen it, Lauren. All right, the three of us have seen it. All y'all who are listening, I'm sorry if I have any spoilers or whatever. Um, but it's not like it's changed very much. But the um, what I really appreciated was the emphasis on the... <laughs> it was almost the sharing of how bad it was for the Irish in New York and the lower... The... the <laughs> I'm like, how do I, how do I say this? That's the Puerto Ricans had the immigrant challenge, but they also had this sense of community that came from their culture that brought them all together in, in a different way that does not in any way wipe out the challenges and the racism that they faced in, in coming, in coming to New York and, and, and being there. But I feel like the film also did a good job at highlighting the shitty conditions of the um, of the Irish that had that that were at that low socioeconomic level that were not that were not in that high sort of you know access and privilege that 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 had a really shitty place in their life too. And the when um, Tony goes to jail and he comes back, I really liked that they highlighted his shift from being in the space that Riff was of like, this is all I know. I'm going to fight in the streets. This is, this is my, my, my world frame that Tony goes, he goes to jail, he comes back and he's like, I don't want that for myself. And, and like, 
I didn't feel like in the original that was there as much as they as they showed it here in in the in the new one. Definitely. Just, just okay. my just my just my thought. So. And I love the fact that they they were diverse. They weren't um, yes. white identifying people playing other ethnicities. I love that. I mean, there is that. Like, actually, actually yeah. did that better. <laughs> I I really enjoyed this new um, this new film. I I really loved what Spielberg did with it, and. I really love that it started off in a place from this gentrification place of this neighborhood mm. and how this neighborhood was being destroyed for Lincoln Center because I felt like that was a very yeah. beautiful um, admission, recognition of the sacrifices that had to be made so we can have the things that we love. <laughs> yeah, so that, that things like like Lincoln Center and theater, the theater district and things like that exist. Yeah, definitely. So we're at the top of the hour. Laura, thanks for joining us again. It's nice to see You're your welcome. almost face, but your, your theater yeah. with the popcorn and, and I feel like I need to double fist uh, pops at this point. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, Lauren, do you wanna say any final words? I just love, I, I love knowing that on Monday nights, no matter what crappy things are happening in the world, I can see your shining face and reconnect with Laura and make new theater friends and come together in this place um, around this love that we have for this art form. I love that. Yeah. And, yeah. I, love that. and I love that we can just get nerdy with it. Yes. And all sorts mm -hmm. of our different nerddoms, right? Yes. Our neuroscience mm -hmm. nerddoms. All right, Laura, any thought any any final thoughts you want to share? Uh let's see. I'm just thinking. Um, I know that I mentioned it in the chat, and I know I've mentioned it also on my social media. I feel like or even though this is about like this is made in the UK. But there's this musical that I found one random day when I was uh, just having, when I was just doing summer. And the musical is called Fantastically Great Women Who Changed the World. And I feel like that's really cool. It talks about a lot of, it talks about Mary Curie, it talks about uh, Sacagawea, it talks about... Uh, Amelia Earhart talks about a lot of people who are actually from America, but it's a specifically British show. Hmm. Is it, it? It's it's a book or a musical? It's a musical. Um, you can find it on Spotify. It is a musical. Okay. Amazing. Okay. Yes. More things for us to adventure into. I just started also very women censored, which I really enjoy. Oh, sorry. Very what? I also said very women centered, which I reach, which I really enjoy. Nice. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you, Laura, for tuning in. And um, thank you, Demetrius. We hope to see you again. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's go theater. Well, yeah. Let's go theater. <laughs> and we will see you next Monday, same time, same place, 7.30 p.m. Eastern, 4.30 yeah. on the West Coast. <laughs> yep. I love it. It's a 